Hey you guys, welcome back to Reports on China. I'm Andy. Well, the Tokyo Olympics is over, so today we'll take a look at some hilariously tragic Western mainstream media takes on China's performance at Tokyo 2020. Let's get reporting. Hey, I'm Andy. I've always been obsessed with media. I started my own neighborhood newspaper at 10 and my own TV channel at 15. At 19, I launched a national magazine that was available all over New Zealand. I worked for New Zealand politicians for a few years before our Prime Minister gave me a scholarship to come to China and study a master's degree in Chinese language and culture. I decided to stay, and now I'm a columnist and filmmaker in Shanghai. Come with me as I analyse how the world reports on China. Tokyo 2020 was seen for many as symbolic of the battle between world superpowers China and the US. That led to some interesting displays from Western mainstream media, which aimed to either paint China's success as somehow nefarious, downplay its success, or both. In the end, the final gold tally was very close, with the US taking top spot with 39 gold medals, congratulations, and China just behind on 38, good job. Now, typically, medal tallies during the games favour the team with the most gold to determine first place, but whenever China was ahead, certain news agencies decided to change the rules and list first place as whichever team had the most medals in total. But before we start, don't forget to hit like and leave a comment so that this video can be seen by more people. Check out ABC News' fancy Olympic medal tracker, which placed the US first when it was actually third at that point under conventional measures. Interesting. When China's lead was too obvious to ignore, other Western media decided it was time to downplay China's success, like the Washington Post's Paul Musgrave, who rabbited on for about 1,600 words about how he's decided Olympic medals no longer show off any given nation's cultural power. Isn't it interesting how some people like to change the rules when it looks like things aren't going their way? The Financial Times agreed in an article aptly titled, China's sporting success at Tokyo 2020 is tinged with politics, where they argued that excess nationalism may overshadow its achievements. Check this out. Two Chinese medalists even kissed the Chinese flag after they won gold and silver. Oh my god. The article goes on to say, the Communist Party has built a formidable sports program around success in the Olympics, which it sees as an important source of national pride and international legitimacy. Firstly, the use of the term Communist Party here is disingenuous and designed simply to paint China's efforts with a sinister light. You don't ever see Western teams described based on the political entities running certain countries and regions. So in this regard, it's actually the Financial Times who are politicizing China's success. No one described the US team using the Democrats as a moniker, and we didn't see New Zealand's team in any way described as Jacinda Ardern's team. Secondly, since when has Olympic success not been a vehicle for national pride and international legitimacy? I'm from New Zealand, a small country of nearly 5 million. Every single Olympics is used as a way for us to not only feel proud on the world stage, but to beat out our trans-Tasman rivals, Australia. Every single year, New Zealand media will talk about how New Zealand, despite being small, punches above its weight at the Olympics. Check out this headline from one of New Zealand's top news channels, which literally uses that exact term. We also use a different medal tally to make New Zealanders feel better about how we do in the Olympics. The per capita medal tally, which looks at a country's population and medal take. Here you can see New Zealand was fifth overall when judged by population per medal, and an impressive third overall using population per gold medal. So why is it not okay for national pride and international legitimacy now? Oh, that's right, because it's China who's feeling national pride and international legitimacy. Financial Times, you actually suck. They continue to politicize China's success further on in the article, where they mention the 2022 Winter Games. As the party leadership prepares for Beijing, they say. Again, it's only when referring to countries like China that a host of the Olympics is referred to by any other name than the country name. As China prepares for Beijing would be much more fair and honest. Let's take a quick look at some hypocrisy from the New York Times. Here are two reports, one about a young US gold medalist and one about a young Chinese gold medalist. First, let's see how they frame China here when they discuss gold medalist Hou Zhihui. 
China's sports assembly line is designed for one purpose, churning out gold medals for the glory of the nation, the article says. This implicitly dehumanizes Chinese athletes by comparing them to products made in a factory, which instantly conjures up negative images in Western readers. The article continues with a reference to Beijing sports czars and mentions how a giant Chinese flag covers the wall of a Beijing training center, reminding lifters that their duty is to nation, not to self. Here, the New York Times are continuing to dehumanize Chinese athletes by presenting them as parts of a larger machine and not individual people. Back at home, sports officials redoubled their efforts, even if a growing number of middle-class parents were unwilling to give their children to the state for grooming as athletes. Clearly, the entire article paints a dystopian picture of Chinese sporting success, suggesting that athletes are the products of an assembly line and that they're groomed by the state. Now let's take a look at the New York Times article on US gold medalist Sunisa Lee. Lee wasn't training just for herself, the article says. She went to the gym every day for all the first generation Americans who wanted to achieve success when their parents had come to the United States with nothing. So Lee herself said her grueling Olympic journey wasn't just for herself as an individual, and that it was to show immigrants that they can achieve success. Lee saw herself as a representative of the Hmong American community, and not as an individual, which is heralded here as admirable and worthy, a stark contrast from the story on Chinese gold medalist Hou Zhihui. Anyway, this episode could literally go on forever, so we better end it here for today. See you all next time.